Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble, and I am excited to be here with Ray Levier. Uh, we're going to be talking about his story, uh, his new book, and some uh, techniques that will really help you de-stress, which, I mean, I'm feeling a little stressed right now, honestly. It's like the end of a long month, and I'm looking toward a vacation, and I'm thinking, eh, I think I wish I had some of these in my pocket to de-stress right now. So we're going to talk about that. But before we do, let's get into uh, your story, Ray. I'd love to hear... Um, just how you got started in music, kind of what happened along the way and what brought you to where you are today. Yeah. So, um, I started playing the drums. I come from a musical family. First of all, my dad plays piano. My sister has been playing piano ever since she was really little single digits. Uh, my aunt Barbara, my dad's sister is, uh, she was quite an accomplished jazz pianist and studied with Chick Corea and Lenny Tristano and, uh, she was pretty heavy. So, um, there's music in my family. Um, but how I got to the drums was kind of just, nobody guided me to the drums. I guided myself and basically my dad had rehearsals at the house and he had a drum kit that he, an old crappy drum kit that he bought from somewhere. So the, you know, drummer wouldn't have to bring his drums to the house. So anyway, um, these drums ended up in the basement a couple of years later and I just pulled them out one day and started banging on them um, and really didn't know anything about time keeping a groove or anything like that. I just liked banging on these drums as most young children do. So my dad was, you know, uh, listening to what I was doing on the drums and he said, all right, I don't mind you playing the drums, but you got to take some lessons. So I was like, all right. So I started studying. Uh, but before I got to my first lesson, I got caught in a fire in the backyard. It was a chicken coop that we turned into our little hangout. And we would stay there, you know, overnight on the weekends uh, with a couple friends. And this particular night, a candle caught the the wall of the uh structure while we were all sleeping oh my gosh uh so my brother was the first to wake up and he ran out and tripped over my friend who was tr who was on the floor sleeping he woke up and he ran out and as he ran out uh that's when i woke up and started screaming and, and i didn't know what was going on i just thought i was dreaming i thought i was having a bad nightmare totally in shock um uh, so he came back in and basically I hear someone saying, close your eyes and your mouth and don't breathe. And next thing I know, I'm out in the grass and I see like flames in the grass from where I'd been rolling. And like, um, and I noticed there was a huge flame, big fire behind me. And I, I was just dreaming and I didn't, I didn't realize it was a fire or anything. I was just in this weird state. Um, and then all of a sudden my mom showed up because we're in the backyard and, you know, uh, TR went up to the house and banged on the door and my mom woke up and uh, my uh, stepdad woke up and they uh, he called the fire department and the police immediately. And so I'm still in shock. I have no idea what's going on. And I ended up in a burn unit in uh, Westchester, New York, uh, and I spent the next six, close to seven months um uh, getting skin grafts and you know they're basically saving my life to uh um you know just to put me back together 
So I was burned from my navel up, uh, which is, they consider like 60% of your body. And so my lower half was fine. So what they needed to do is take skin from my lower half and put it up and do skin grafts on my upper part of my body to cover me back up. Um, cause I had no skin on my upper body it was all burned off. So that was a grueling, torturous process. Can't even go into how much, how painful that was. I can't even imagine. Um, but, you know, the fact that I was 12 years old uh, helped me because I was very resilient little kid. And um, I sprung back, you know, uh, and but meanwhile, my dad is coming to the hospital and he's like, well, what's going to make you feel better? And I kept thinking of the drums because I just started playing the drums. Mm. And I said, oh, I want to play the drums. I want a drum set. And he was like, you know, all right, we'll set the drums up here in the hospital and you can look at them and then when you get home you can play them and uh and I was like yeah great and it just it be the drums became a just a really positive thing in my mind that really helped me to get through those hard times and I found out later from my dad that one of the nurses heard him talking about we'll get you a drum set yada yada she pulls him aside as he's leaving and says, Mr. Levier, I don't think it's a good idea to, you know, get your son all stoked up over the drums. I mean, you know, he, he his hands are basically almost gone and, you know, he's he's not going to be able to hold a drumstick, let alone, you know, take care of himself, that whole thing. And my father just, uh, from what I understand, just looked at her and said, well, you don't know my son and just <laughs> walked away. Wow. And that was a really, you know, powerful thing that I learned about later in life, because when I heard about that story, I realized like, no, no one can tell you how your life is going to end up except you. And it all comes back to what's in our head and what's in our mind and what we feed our brain with in terms of thoughts. And um, it's either junk food or it's health food. So uh, that was like a big awakening as a 12 year old to realize like wow okay like i'm kind of the master of my ship here and like no one can steer it except for me so that was like one of the epiphanies i had as as a youngster uh because of the accident and i've had all these like openings you know um in terms of life and spirituality just uh based upon you know the the crappy situation i was thrown into um so I started thinking positive thoughts and my mom, every time she came, she was like, think positive thoughts, think good thoughts. And so I, you know, was really practicing that. So anyway, the drums, I kept going back to the drums and the drums just made me feel great. And I would play and I would, I sounded great in my head and like I was, you know, on stage and I'm playing in front of people and, it, you know, everybody's cheering for me. And so that was my positive affirmation that I kept going. So the day came when I got home and uh, my dad, sure enough, brought me to the store and uh, got me that drum kit. And then we got the drums home and I couldn't hold the drumstick with my left hand. I could hold it with the right because I still have most of my digits on the right. But the left hand was kind of like a, a mitten that got all the digits. I mean, I have half of my digits on my hand, but they're all frozen in there from skin, just the way mm -hmm. the skin reconnected. Um, so I would duct tape this stick to my left hand and it would bleed and it wouldn't work that great but I was playing the drums and I didn't care you know so um later down the road you know I started studying with some teachers and later down the road one of my teachers said you know maybe you want to get an operation so you can hold a drumstick with that left hand and I thought about it and eventually took his advice and I went to the hospital and asked the doctor, can you please give me a thumb? Cause so I can hold the drumstick. And the doctor was just like completely flabbergasted and was like, wow, I don't get requests like that every day. Of course we can give you a thumb. So I went up to the Shriners uh, Burn Institute in Boston and they have incredible doctors up there. So they uh, pulled, my thumb was just kind of embedded in the palm and they, they pulled it out and put a graft on it and so now I have this this digit of a thumb there and that's was a complete game changer of how I was to hold the drumstick so now I can hold the drumstick 
but it kind of popped out because it was just this little thumb holding it. So later I, I kind of perfected it by putting a rubber band around the one side of the stick, around the back of my hand, and then around the butt end of the stick, and it would hold it, kind of keep it from coming out. Mm. And another adaptation that I came up with was uh, wig glue. I came up with this, I found this wig glue that was really tacky. So I put that on the stick and it kind of keeps it tacky and firm in there. So that's that's uh, kind of how I came to where I'm at today. And that's the, the same method that I use today uh, as a drummer. Wow, that is an incredible story. And, you know, the the fortitude to to be able to do it. But I love that, you know, your your parents just kind of put this there as like, this is this is your goal. You know, when you're in a situation like that, you really do need a goal. Yeah. And, you know, it helps you helps you move forward and press forward. And even when it's hard and all that stuff. So kudos to your parents for doing that. Yeah, they um, were great. They yeah, were really it sounds great. like they were really, really in your corner. At they that were. Point. And, and still so are. when you so you learned to play the drums and then did you start playing like as as an amateur? Did you have a band? Did you start playing professionally? Yeah, I was in high school and I was, you know, playing as an amateur and, and learning and getting better and better and practicing. Um, I didn't really take it very seriously. I just enjoyed playing the drums. And when you're that young, you don't think about your future and your career and all that. So I was just having fun with it. And then around 18, uh, as I was graduating high school, then it kicked in like, wow, what are you going to do with your life kind of thing? So. I kept thinking and thinking of like what I wanted to do for a career and uh, nothing really came to me except the drums. The drums kept coming up. And um, so I was like, all right, I'm going to be a drummer and I'm going to go to school and I'm going to practice as much as I can. And I'm going to just do that, be a life lifelong musician. So I went down that road and went to William Patterson University in uh, Patterson, New Jersey, and they have one of the best jazz programs in the country. Went there for four years, um, got my butt kicked and um, in a good way. And I, I really didn't know how to play jazz when I went to the school. And, you know, I've never played with any jazz musicians. So here I am in these ensembles and I'm like, you know, just scuffling but I learned quick you know I, I learned where I was at and I saw where I was at and I saw where other people were at with their level of proficiency and I was like all right I gotta pick it up here <laughs> so you know I, I literally practiced my drums and you know um you know music in general of arranging and listening and um you know my life was just music 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 and school and drumming and practicing and and that was it. And I got a lot together in a very short amount of time because I was very focused and wasn't hanging out with anybody. You know, I didn't drink, didn't smoke, didn't, no drugs, nothing like that. Just completely dedicated to my craft. And uh, it's amazing how much you can get done when you when you get very laser focused like that, you know? Yeah, that's. The, yeah, absolutely. So I'm curious because I went to school for music, but I was a vocalist and played piano and all that for people that are on a drum track do they have to learn do they have to do music theory and all of that stuff when you say on a drum track do you mean in terms of just playing and yeah like your your degree is going to be in you know dr jazz drumming or you know what was your actual degree in my my I had a BA in performance which okay it's basically useless <laughs> but uh, <laughs> You know, no one, no one's like, well, if you want to come to our gig, we need to see your diploma. You know, um, my, I had a couple of people that wanted me to go to school to, to be like a teaching degree, you know, cause then you can fall back on that and the whole security of that. And I just, I had no interest at all in doing that. I just wanted to play. I just wanted to perform, but to answer your question, like, I don't think theory or anything like that, you know, it's, um, that's conceptual stuff that should stay in the classroom. And like when you're playing, you you're, you're playing, you're in the moment. And um, um, so that's leading into my book. One of the reasons I wanted to write this book was uh, 
I noticed certain times when I'm practicing or playing with musicians that I'm super focused sometimes. And then other times I can't get out of my own way. And this was, you know, just befuddled me of like, why does this happen one way? How, how come I'm in the flow sometimes? How come I'm not? And um, so I realized it all comes down to just concentration and being present, being mindful. And I was always into meditation and, you know, trying to quiet the mind and reading spiritual books and stuff like that. But it was always kind of something that, you know, I just would, I never really merged the two worlds. And then a couple of years ago and during COVID and all that, where things got really weird for everybody, um, I started thinking about my life and, you know, uh, you know, I'm like midlife crisis type of thing. And I'm like, well, what am I doing? Where am I going? Where's the purpose and meaning? And I realized that you have to make the purpose and meaning and you have to be mindful and, you know, uh, not you, but I'm speaking for myself. I had to really do that for myself. Otherwise I just felt like I was floundering. So uh, I always thought about writing a drum book, but I didn't want to put another drum book out there just because there's so many great drum books. And what am I going to say that's going to be different? And mm -hmm. so I started after COVID and thinking everything I just said to you, I started thinking like, you know, like I think the world needs to be more mindful, especially musicians. And I think people can benefit out of if I can somehow merge together breathing and playing and meditation and neuroscience and some Zen like I think people would really benefit from that and could get something out of that. So that's that's the premise and the, the goal behind the book that I put out called Drumming and Flow. And it's you know if you can get with all those things and be more mindful, uh, you'll naturally be heading toward a flow state. Like flow happens when we're mindful, right? It happens when we're not our egoic mind isn't going blah 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 you know, we get quiet for that moment. And it's like the instrument always almost plays us. And I know you're a vocalist. So like, that's a tricky instrument. You know, I sing too. And vocals are so tricky, because it has so much to do with what's going on in your head. And like, even like my vocal teacher said, it's smile when you sing. And just by smiling, like you it changes, you know, it changes the tone, it changes everything. So it's like, you know, hopefully people will be able to benefit from that, you know, all musicians. Yeah, no, that, and it's obviously like while we're performing, that's one of the hardest times to get in flow state. It, do the exercises that you talk about in the book, are they things you can actually use while you're performing? Because I notice in myself, like sometimes it's really hard to even stay present while I'm performing mm -hmm. because I start thinking about my grocery list or whatever, you know? <laughs> yep. Yep. I'm with you. Um, yes. So that's a really good question. And <clears throat> it's really about coming back. Like you realize, oh, I'm thinking about my grocery list. I should be here. I'm not on the bandstand. I'm back in my house thinking about the grocery list. So you have this moment where your brain goes, come back, come back, Brie. And you come back and now you're there again. And then you're there and you don't think about being there. You're just there. And then all of a sudden you're not there. <laughs> and then you realize, oh, I just thought about, did I turn the co coffee pot off? Come back, Brie, come back again. And you come back and like, that's the process for, I think everybody, you know? And so it's training the body to come back. And it's like, it, it's no different than training a dog to come. Like you like come and the dog doesn't do it at first. And then you keep repeating it. And eventually the dog understands that when I hear that word come, they don't know what come means. They just go, they hear that tone and they know that that means master wants me to come. So you know, it's like you kind of strengthening that part of yourself that goes, come back. And, you know, you're this, you know, kind of like puppy or whatever off, you know, just sniffing around and you're lost in, in the moment of thinking about whatever you're thinking about. And then you get snapped out of it and then you're, you're back on track. So that's the meditation part of the book. And that's the, the real world reason that I meditate. 
uh, you know, it's thousands of year old and it's esoteric and all that really cool stuff. And it can get you to deeper realms within yourself. Uh, but I think the practical application for most people is being mindful and like, how do you get mindful? You got to practice it. You know, it's like no different than playing a scale. <clears throat> you got to practice being mindful more than not being mindful. And once it's on your radar, you have to practice it and you have to keep it on your radar. And it's like, if we don't, uh, it's like any other practice. If, if I don't go to the gym, uh, thinking about having big muscles is never going to it's is never going to happen. You got to actually pick up the weights and lift them. Or if you want to be a marathon runner, it's like you just got to put your feet to the pavement and you got to go out every day and you got to be consistent. So that's the theme is consistency. And whether it's practicing an instrument or practicing being mindful, you have to be consistent and you can't expect these things to happen overnight. They, I mean, I'm still practicing the same 16th note triplet licks or whatever on my instrument for ever since I started practicing. And it's like, my mind is going, all right, Ray, you've been practicing this for the last 20 something years on this instrument. You still don't have it. Why are you, why are you doing this? And it's like, well, I'm just going <laughs> to keep doing it. If it takes me three lifetimes, you know, that's the, that's the idea is to just consistency, just keep doing it, keep pounding it into the ground. Um, and then there's the neuroscience of where you're you're teaching your body to fire certain neurons in your in your brain and like if you again if you don't fire these neurons like they just don't turn on and off uh naturally so there's a whole system that's happening between your brain and your your thoughts and what's being dumped neurochemically between you know like um, oxytocin and feel good chemicals and, um, you know, stress chemicals. And, um, so we're, we're kind of training the physiological body. So that's really what the, yeah, in a long winded way, that's what the book is about. Uh, it's about training the body. It's about training the mind. And do I breathe? Do I do these breathing techniques on the gig? No, not really. But sometimes I do, like if I'm having a really hard time, I can just focus on my breath and I seem to get out of my head. So it's really about getting out of your head and back into your body. And that's really the the, the coin term is that's what it does. It gets you out of your head, back into your body. And uh, flow state can only happen when you're in your body and you're not in your egoic thinking mind. Uh, so anyway, that's the idea behind the whole premise of the book. And I hope some people can uh, utilize those key things that I just pointed out. Yeah, it makes total sense. And and doing it in your practice will, you know, embed it, right? So then when mm -hmm. you're at a gig and if you need to use it, then you can. Yeah. Um, I was curious, do you have any like, you know, cause you're talking about the dog and like hearing the master say come and all that stuff. But sometimes like, I literally don't realize that my mind has wandered. Like do yeah. you use anything as like triggers. Mm. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, the trigger really is having the will and the want to get to that point because otherwise we're just, we're completely unconscious. And you know, when you're unconscious, it's not your fault. You just like, like if you said something rude to me and you didn't mean to say something rude, you're just an unconscious person and it just came out of you. Like that's forgivable. You know, it's, it's like you weren't malicious. You, you, you didn't premeditate this thought to hurt me or anything. You just said it because you're unconscious. And if you're unconscious, you're just, you're really not, you're not mindful and you're not there and you're really not, privy to what's happening in the in the real world scenario in that moment so how do we even get there i mean it again it's just the wanting to be there wanting to be that type of person that can be more mindful knowing what the benefits are yeah yeah i mean it, yeah it's kind of like a cycle right like you're more mindful because you're mindful about needing to be mindful <laughs> yeah and it's like, okay, I want to eat better. So it's like, 
maybe you eat at McDonald's five times a week and you eat pizza and you eat all this stuff that's just not good for your body. Uh, and you're really unconscious about it. You don't even think about it. Like that was me with food. Uh, like you put food in front of me, I eat it, you know? And it's like, it wasn't until, you know, a, eight years ago, uh, my father had a triple bypass and almost died. And um, they equated it to his poor diet and hardening of the arteries and all that stuff that you get when you don't eat right and you smoke most of your life. So like, that was a huge wake up call for me. And that's one of the reasons I went uh, vegan was to really, um, you know, not that I'm going to live forever. It's not adding years to your life. It's adding life to your years. Mm -hmm. um, and so anyway, that's, that's kind of the thing. I was completely unconscious and now I'm conscious of it. And um, it's to the point now where I'm, I can't not think that way. So it's, that's really, you just have to train yourself like any other being to, you know, like a dog or whatever to, to just come back and, uh, and to, to be aware. And so I don't know, just kind of rambling, but you get it. I do. No, I, I'm actually curious um, because it, it is hard as a musician to be healthy because of the kind of lifestyle that we have, especially if we're touring or oh God, you know, just know. doing different gigs and stuff. How, how do you find that being a, being a vegan? It's hard. Um, um, a lot of what I do is, um, I, I eat before I go to gigs if, you know, so, um, or I bring my own food. Um, it's, it's actually not that hard if you premeditate it. I have a lot of fruit. I eat tons of fruit. I'm a kind of a fruitarian, vegetarian or vegan, you know, um, but it's hard because, you know, I try not to eat oil either because oil is, is, is apparently it's not really good for your endothelium. Your endothelium is the lining on all of your veins. And we have 50,000 miles of veins in our body, which basically goes around the planet over two times. So like nobody thinks about their vein health, but like, your vein is, is the, you know, your veins carry all the nutrients and everything to the rest of your body. So, uh, it makes sense to take care of your, your body. So, you know, I'm, I don't go crazy with not doing oil or anything. I'm not like this maniac about it. So if I'm on a gig and like the other day, like they had, they brought out penne vodka pasta and I know it's got cream in it or whatever, but I'm like, all right, so, you know, once in a while, it's no big deal. And it's like, um, and it's the same thing with falling off the horse. It's like, you know, you fall off the horse with being mindful and trying to do this breathing stuff. And it's like, it happens. It's just, that's just how things go as a human being. And you, the important thing is that you found yourself and you get back on the horse again. So, um, and not, you know, being kind to yourself and not being so mean that you fell off the horse and you start... Mm -hmm beating yourself up for things. And that can be a whole nother conversation that a lot of people, like a lot of how I got stuff done was not being nice to myself. I would be like, no, you're sitting here for the next six hours and you're going to go over your rudiments and you're going to practice and you're going to do this. And I would be like this task mask that like just wouldn't get off my back. And even if, I did six hours and I meant to do eight. I would be angry at myself for the rest of the night. Cause I didn't do those extra two hours. And what does that mean? And maybe you're not serious. And maybe, you know, I go down this rabbit hole of, um, but I got a lot accomplished and I, I got a lot done because I was such a taskmaster, but I don't think you need to be so negative to get things done. You know, now I try to be real polite to myself and if I don't feel like practicing, I'm like, well, maybe it's time to go for a walk. And that walk becomes, I get much more out of my practice session walking than I do if I sat in my drum room practicing a paradiddle for the next two hours being miserable. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And and for me, sometimes I can practice in my head. Like if I've just mm -hmm. had it, like with singing too, it's like you can only sing for so long and you're going to yeah. hurt your vocal cords. And so like I can... I can mentally go through what I need to sometimes, like you said, on a walk, and that can be just as productive, if not sometimes more productive. Sure. Yep, I agree. 
Well, I know that you also do arranging, you uh, create music for film and TV. So why don't you talk a little bit about that? Because, you know, there are musicians listening to this and watching this that um, are always looking for like multiple streams of income. And so, you know, how did you kind of get into those areas? Right. Um, and that what you just said there is, I think it's key because we're at a state uh, where the music industry is is not what it used to be and you used to be able to just be a, a side man uh you know and you can just make a living like kind of that's kind of how my dad uh he made a lot of money just playing music um but i think you know being diversified in many different skill levels can help you um so i got into writing music for television through my friend rich tozzoli who had been doing it for many years prior and he's got hundreds of thousands of tv cues that he's written so uh he was doing these tv cues with uh like drum machines and you know drum loops and uh so i took a lesson from him a pro tools lesson to learn how to work pro tools because it was just such a difficult program for me so uh, he came over a couple of times and he said, hey, well, maybe we can do a session. It'd be more fun to play with a drummer than it would be to do these loops. So that's how we fell into it together. And then um, so he just kind of taught me the way of, um, you know, what makes a good TV cue and, uh, you know, writing for TV land, um, keeping things very simple and catchy. And um, so I learned a lot about that. Um, and it's it's a formulaic sauce that you got to give these people because you're you're writing for the editor. Um, you're basically writing for this guy who's sitting there watching the show, and he's trying to fill under bed music, and he's got he's got twenty shows he needs to get to, and he's got you know so much time. So if you make it easy for him uh they'll tend to use your cues more than other guys because a lot of people hand in songs with lyrics and all this stuff and like they're not looking for that uh vocals rarely get used in tv land uh because it's distracting you don't want to hear somebody singing when you're trying to listen to dialogue of yep. some guy in a store so they just want dan, 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 something really simple that can go underneath all this. And the guy comes in and says, hi, how you doing? And I got an old rifle that I'd like to sell here and, you know, whatever's going on on the show. Um, so that's what I learned in my uh, in my endeavors with the music. Um, so it's simple. And, you know, like I'm now I'm no genius writer. I'm like. You know, arranging is something that I, was very hard for me and still is, and I don't really need to do that. But um, I keep it really simple, and I think that's what really helps me with the TV stuff is it was kind of made for me, you know, from a, a drummer's <laughs> uh, perspective. Um, you know, it just, I, I tend to write simple anyway, so uh, it works. Yeah, I mean, that is true. Like sometimes uh, we singer songwriters, like our stuff is really too complicated to be used mm -hmm. in TV, especially. Yeah. So they need people like you. So that's that's great. It's great when you can find like a niche that, that perfectly fits your mm -hmm. skills. Yeah. And it's the great thing is too, is like nobody, you know, if you write for like a TV commercial or or a show or something like that, then you have executives that want to put their two cents in and then it gets complicated and they're like, we don't want to hear that, or we want to hear more drums or we want to hear less of this. And none of that happens with what I do. I just hand in tracks, uh, a certain BPM, a certain genre. And um, most of the time it's, it's up tempo because up tempo gets people excited. And um you know, it's, it's pretty formulaic, like I said. Yeah. And I also, I know you mentioned that you're doing kind of an electronica project as well. Yeah, this uh, is an exciting project that uh, I got into with my friend, 
Franny Lugo, who is an incredible musician, incredible artist. And I found out he's like really good at doing CGI. And I didn't know that till I called him. And I had this idea for a music video that just came out called Uncharted Destiny. You could see it on my YouTube channel. Um, and this kind of, this song came about uh, before the video, obviously. And the song came about during COVID and uh, during a breakup with my girlfriend at the time, we had been living together and then COVID and the breakup happened all at once. And it just felt so dark and empty. And I just kept thinking about the, the cold darkness of space and like how people were dying, uh, you know, in hospitals and they couldn't say goodbye to their loved ones. And it just made me think of like David Bowie being in a capsule, and you know, so I kind of wrote this song, um, about trusting the process and about we don't know what's going to happen none of us you know, know what's going to happen and like um it's going with the flow once again um and adapting to what's happening and it's it's also reflective of what happened in my life where everything was going fine as a kid and then next thing you know your life is just completely th thrown on end so how do you deal with that you know and it's like you think your life is over. And um, so this character in the video thinks his life is over. And then, but he realizes that he, there's a whole nother life and a whole nother world for him on the other edge, on the other side of the galaxy where he meets these alien people that are, he's kind of related to, and I won't give it away, but um, it's, so it's kind of this play on David Bowie and um, that character and, um so it's basically this this guy who's um me that crashes a jet airplane a top secret jet airplane and uh but he doesn't know his whole life he's he's part alien and he's he has these aliens that are monitoring him and setting him up for his future and like so he has this crash and he thinks his life is over but that's when it just begins for him and they they send this craft and um it's encased in a meteor and they don't know it's they don't know how to get it out it's kind of like the sword from the stone so when i walk into the room the thing turns on and the stone goes away and there's a ship in front of me because it's it's meant for me it's meant to take me back home uh so it, this ship grabs me and that's when the song starts and the the whole journey is uh and it, but it's about a journey it's about the journey of life and it's about trusting the unknown and not knowing where we're going and and regardless how bad life gets for you there's always hope and there's there's always a future wow it's quite a backstory for that yeah song. I, I didn't mean to go into the full no, backstory no, no, it's cool but, uh, i mean so uh, you, it was interesting because you're you know saying all this stuff and i'm like how is this going on in the song but then obviously that is all part of the video and then the song starts so franny uh, back to franny he's the one that did all we did it all cgi and green screen and I just can't believe this guy manned this one person, you know, it took almost two years, but normally you'd have a room full of hundreds of people like at Pixar doing this. And this, this one man did it. And uh, I was just so blown away by that. I was just like, wow, that's incredible. So we started talking about doing a duo project and how to project because a lot of what we do is visuals and we wanted to, to project this video on the screen and then we would play underneath it, mm -hmm. uh, play to the click track, and we plug our computers in through Ableton Live and everything sequenced. And so that's kind of where we started going with the song. And then that ended up our writing process of where we're going with, with the band vibe. Wow. So is the video out? Yeah, the video is out. It's on my YouTube channel and uh, people can check it out. Okay. And did they just look up your name to find you on YouTube? Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think mm -hmm. after that description, they're they're going to want to watch it. So that's I, I definitely want to go watch it. That sounds yeah. If you, if you like it, comment and uh, let me know what you thought. I'd be interested. Cool. Well, where can people find your book? Uh, it's on Amazon. <clears throat> it's on Hudson Music. That's their website. That's the publishing company is HudsonMusic.com. And uh, yeah, so those two places you can get it. Awesome. Drumming and flow, right? 
Yeah, there's videos to go. Uh, there's some videos of the breathing modality. There's like a code. If you buy the book, they tell you what the code is, and then you can see the videos. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that's really useful because, you know, you read about an exercise like that. You want to be able to see how to how to do it and stuff. So that's, yep. that's and very cool. Some of the breathing modalities that are in there is uh, the Wim Hof breathing method, which is rapid breathing and uh, really gets you fired up. And uh, it actually induces stress in the body and, and cortisol, um, um, adrenaline. And so what it does is is it gets you used to being in that state and staying calm. Mm. So like when we get all jacked up and adrenaline starts going, most people like lose their cool. So th that's what that breathing modality is about is really remaining calm, even though your body is going through these uh, physical, phys physiological height, heightened state. Yeah. That's really useful. So you don't, so you can actually practice that instead of having to be in a scary situation first. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that then there's sense. coherent breathing that I found out about where you breathe in for five seconds and out for five seconds. And if you if you go on YouTube and you search coherent breathing, you'll you'll see these cool little things that uh, the, the guides that go in for five seconds out, five seconds in, and it goes real slow and you just follow mm -hmm. the, the bell breathing in five, breathing out five. And what that does is stimulates your vagus nerve and your vagus nerve is like your main ganglia of nerves that go down your spine to the other nerves. Um, and it synchronizes your electromagnetic uh, field of your heart and your brain. So they get in sync. That's where the coherence comes from. And then um, they've done some really crazy studies about this. Like when your brain and your heart go into sync uh it's like some really weird stuff happens with um like energy and and people around you feel it and like so i try to practice this before i play with people because um we're all kind of these transformers that emit energy you know <laughs> and like so like if we can be in our best energy like i think people feel that when we're around them you know yeah, no, that's awesome. And, you know, you're bringing your best self to the, to the group, to the gig. Yeah. Amen to that. <laughs> and that's so really what it's all about. Like at the end of the day, it's like, I might not be, it's not about talent and how good you are and whatever. It's like, what am I bringing to the table? Like mm -hmm. I've been hired many times as a drummer because not because I'm the most amazing drummer, but because I'm a cool guy and like, I'm a team player and I'm like, how can I help? You know, instead of like, when do we eat? You know, uh, how much am I getting paid? Where's the gig? That's a lot of driving and traffic. You know, like who wants to put up with that regardless of how great you are? Like you want to know that you're going to be there on time. You're going to play nice and, you know, drive the bus and go home. <laughs> yep. And not be a prima donna. Totally. Yeah. I've been around that. It's, it's really, it sucks the life out of you. Mm -hmm very uh unsettling yeah no i love that uh, that's great advice to close out this episode is just be someone that people want to be around yeah that's <laughs> it and that's the best way to get a gig i'm telling you like be responsible call people back like don't leave people hanging like the simple things that don't require talent there's zero talent there all you got to do is call somebody back be courteous show up on time, you know, don't talk back and just smile and like, do your part. Like if I'm going to a jazz gig, I'm not trying to, you know, I'm just, I got to play jazz. If I'm going to a funk gig, I got to play funk. If I'm going to a reggae gig, I got, you know, you got to put on the right hat. So <laughs> that's for whatever it's worth. Yeah, that makes sense. Where can people find you online? Uh, all the socials. Uh, I'm on Facebook and I'm on Instagram and I'm on YouTube. Um, I have a website, raylevier.com. And um, you can sign up for my email there and you get a free gift of, uh, I give away a breathing modality if you sign up for email. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. Ray Levier, L-E-V-I-E-R.com. You got it. 
Awesome. Thank you so much. This has been a great conversation. I loved hearing your story and just, just the positivity that you bring to the world is so appreciated. And mm, I hope thanks. it rubs off on everybody that's listening. Yeah, I hope so too, because it's really important to stay positive and there's too much negativity out there and it's a choice, you know, we'll end with that. It really is a choice. It's like, well, how do I get a better life? You have to just switch your thinking. And it's always a choice, you know? Yep. Mic drop. Thanks for that. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.